So what you see on the screen is one of these, like uh, you've seen these math sort of mind reading tricks. So the question is first pick a value of X greater than one. This could be a decimal, you know, any, any number. It could be as big as you want, as long as it's bigger than one. If you want to make it a fraction, you know, like an improper fraction, like six over five, whatever you want. Um, you can make a decimal greater than one, up to any number. You can make it a fraction. And then it's asking you to calculate this thing, which is x plus one over x, and then divide that by two, then square it, and then subtract x minus one over x divided by two, and square that. And everyone's going to have a different starting number, but let's see what happens. So everyone take a minute to work on that. Okay, I see one person got the numerical answer. Go ahead, everybody. Uh, do x plus one over x, square it. Do x minus one over x, use the calculator for this, uh, and square that, and then subtract the two answers. And when you get an answer, type it into the chat.
Okay, I see um, some people got um, one is their answer. Or someone got zero uh, as the answer. Let's take a look. I'm going to bring up the graphing calculator. Okay, so here, what I did is I stored, I did two, and then I stored it. I pushed this button above the on key and stored it into X. And then I did this calculation and it did become, oops, I forgot, over two. Uh, that will be annoying to fix. So let me, um, <clears throat> so I do parentheses, I'm going to need, if I do alpha and y equals, I get a fraction. And this is a fraction with two in the denominator. And in the numerator, it's x plus, I think I could just do that. I don't need to get like that. Squared minus parentheses. Alpha, y equals, let's let me make a nice fraction. Uh, two's in the denominator. And x minus one <clears throat> over x. Oops, that's a lot of parentheses. I didn't mean to do that. What I meant to do was come out here and put a single parentheses and square that. And we do end up with one. And if I try a different number, like I said, someone said I had five was X. And then if I push, I think if I just push up twice, it will redo this calculation and it becomes one again. And the truth is no matter what you pick, 10.7, if I make that my x value, store that into x, and then do, if I do second enter it, at twice, it brings back that all the calculation, that also becomes one. So the answer is always gonna be one. We'll, we'll look at why that is in a minute, but that's gonna lead us to an important thing later on in uh, today's lesson here. I'm gonna bring back the iPad. Um, professor, before you continue, I just have a quick question. Yes. Is the only homework today on Delta Math? I didn't see anything on the Google Classroom. That's right. There's uh, just Delta Math questions for tonight. Got it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, this, uh, the fact that this always becomes the number one and not the number four, that's a big four considering the answer was supposed to be one. Uh, today we're going to look at two famous Babylonian artifacts. One of them is called uh, YBC, which stands for Yale, Yale something collection, YBC 7289. And the other one is called Plimpton. And those are the two most famous Babylonian mathematical artifacts. We'll look at what they are and what they, what they say and try to do some, uh, analyze them. I think I'll start with the YBC 7289. Here's what YBC 7289 looks like. And it's very small. It's, it's like an inch and a half. It's this tiny thing. It was actually about 10 years ago they had both of these tablets. Uh, they had both of them in New York City. They had a math exhibit, a museum with uh, math exhibits. And this was not a very crowded uh, tourist attraction. And there they were right there. They actually had them next to each other in the same little case, even though uh, one belongs to Yale and the other one <clears throat> Plimpton 322 belongs to uh, Columbia. 
well, what is this thing? Well, it's got a diamond shape on it. And it's got, if you look carefully, it's got that, those Babylonian, you know, numbers on them. But it's kind of hard to see what they are. So here is a, um, someone like made a nice sort of drawing of it. Okay, with this, we can see it a little bit better. This number over here is 30, because it's got three sort of diagonal wedges. Over here, we actually have a three digit number, digit number one, digit number two, actually four digit number, digit number three, and digit number four. Uh, there's nobody waiting to get in now. There's uh, 12 people, including me. There, there, were, there were two people that I let in. Good. Okay, so look at those four. What are those? Let me write down and put commas in, put commas in between the... Um... Now, it's a little bit ambiguous, maybe. But you've got... And this is right, 124, 50, 124, 51, 10. Now that's quite a large number because this is the ones, the 60s, the 3600s, and the 216 thousands. However, if we were to put, they figured out, that there's actually the decimal point over there. Why don't you take a minute and turn, so this number has a ones place, a 60th, a 3600, and this, this one, I think um, 60 times 60 times 60 is 216 thousandths. Anyway, if you have a calculator handy, or just on a computer, convert this four digit base 60 number that has a implied decimal point there. And what do you end up with? Oh, someone is now waiting to get in. Okay, they're in. Okay, Stephen, I see 1.4139. It's off by a tiny bit, but not, but not much. Anyone have a, a different answer? Okay, these are all close. I, I did it on my computer. I got there. I, th I think that's better. Oh, oh you, you, did, you did 50 instead of 51. Hmm. 
414-212-2163. That's better, yes. So that one, uh, this 1.414, 6, 1.414, and then 212, like New York City area code, and then 963. 1.414212963. What do you suppose the significance of that number is on this tablet? Have you ever seen a number that's close to 1.414212? Yes, it is approximately the square root of two. And down here at the bottom, what I see here is a uh, Another number, which is 40, the uh, decimals imply there, 40, 25, 30, 40, hmm. Sorry, 42, 42, that's our first number, 42, 25, 35. Okay, so that's a number a little bigger than 42. Anyone have a speculation about what the significance of that number is? Hint, it has something to do with the 30 over there. Any speculation about what the 42.42, which is what this is? This is about 42, 42.42 or 42.43. What do you think the significance of that, of this number down here is? That one. So here we have the uh, approximation of the square root of two. And underneath that, we have this, um, 42 something. Speculation about what that might be talking about. I have a couple of people waiting to come in. Well, here's a question for you then. If I have a square with 30 as the side, how would you calculate out the length of the diagonal? Oh, I see, someone came up with it. 30 times square root of two is, is the, the in, I guess one way to say this is in a 45, 45, 90 right triangle, the hypotenuse is always the, the leg times the square root of two. 30 square root of two. Well, 30 square root of two is about 42.43. Oops. Uh oh. That's not what I wanted to happen. I hope that's saved. Let's see. Okay. Huh, I lost some stuff, but that's okay. Uh, so that is what that other number means. Basically, the YBC, the YBC tablet has on it, again, it has 30 here, which is the, the length of the side of the square. It has this thing, which is the, um, the 124, 50, 110, which is their approximation for the square root of two. And underneath, it has the uh, 42, 25, 35, which is the 
length of the diagonal of this diamond or this, this square. And that's what YBC 7289 is. So it's very famous because that's a very, very precise value for the square root of two, considering this is in like 1600 BC. You know, why did they need such an excellent approximation of the square root of two? And how did they deduce that? It's so accurate. Well, one speculation is that they used a, a technique that's sometimes called a Babylonian square root algorithm. Although ironically, this, the Babylonian square root algorithm that I'm gonna show you doesn't quite get us 1, 24, 50, 1, 10 when we try to apply it to the square root two. But still, this is what, it, this is uh, suggested to be an algorithm that they would have been aware of. The way the Babylon, the insight behind the Babylonian square root algorithm is that if you divide something by its own square root, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna write down square root of nine, you will get its own square root. Because square root times square root equals itself. So if you divide nine by square root of nine, you do get the square root of nine. But if you divide nine by something that's smaller than the square root of nine, then the answer, the quotient, is gonna be bigger than the square root of nine. So this is, let's just make a note, this is less than the square root of nine. And this thing is bigger than the square root of nine. And finally, if I divide something by something less than its own square root, Sorry, if I divide by something bigger, uh, the three is equal to it. If I divide by something bigger than its own square root, I end up with something less than the square root. So if I actually have, I'll know if I'm, a way of checking if I know the square root of something would be to divide by it, divide the number that I'm trying to take the square root of by what I think is the square root. And if I end up with the answer being equal to the thing I divided by, that means that thing is the square root. And if this number is different from this number, well, we could say that the square root is not two or four, it's not two. And this one, the fact that this is different from that means that the square root of nine is not four. But why is that useful? Let's say I want to know um, the square root of five. And I take a guess, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call my guess x with a little, I uh, can't remember if I call it zero. I'm going to call it zero. And my first guess is I think the square root of five is two. I'm wrong, but let's just say that's what, that's what I think. Hmm those guys out of the way. The way you can check if the square root of five is actually equal to two is you can do five divided by two equals 2.5. So what's the first conclusion that you can make? It's a, sim it's a small conclusion, maybe not that earth shattering, but what is something you can say now about the square root of five? based on what happened here, or based on what didn't happen here, what's, a, what's something you can say? Mm -hmm. It is gonna be, um, it's, it's, bigger, it's bigger than two. Well, the first thing is it's not two, because if it were, but then it's, um, so two is not the square root of five. But we have an extra thing because someone wrote it's someone said it's close to, and that's true. 
and someone said it's bigger than, and someone said it's less than. So let's see which conclusion can, which one is it? Is it greater than or less than? So is the square root of five bigger or less than two? Yeah, it is, it is greater than because you see, maybe I don't know at this point whether it's bigger or less, but when I divide, when I, when I divide by square root of two, by two, sorry, and I, when I divide by two, sorry, this guy, my iPad's frozen, it should, a bunch of junk is gonna pop up in a second. There it is. When I divide by two, I get 2.5. That must mean that two is less than the square root of two, and 2.5, two is less than the square root of five, and 2.5 is greater than the square root of five, which lets us say that square root of five is between two and 2.5. So not only do we know that two is not the square root of two, but because when we divided by two, we ended up with something bigger than two, it meant that it was uh, two was less than the square root of five and 2.5 was greater than the square root of five. So it's somewhere between those two numbers. Well, this leads us to our next guess. Now I'm gonna turn this into a formula in a second. So what would be a good new guess that's probably even better than two as a, as a um, what's a guess that's even better than two? We know it's between two and 2.5. So if you had to guess somewhere, what would it be? Yeah, maybe it could, you, it could be like 2.3, you know, somewhere between two and 2.5, but even better with what Christine just said, if we take the average halfway between two and 2.5, Five, we get 2.25. Now, I wish I could just tell you that's the answer, but it's not. Square root of five is an irrational number, and we're not gonna be able to get an exact answer with this process, but we're gonna get an approximation. Let me go to a new page, and I wanna show you how I'll do this with like a formula. So x zero, I'm gonna say is equal to one x1 in this case is the old guess i'm sorry two is the x here the old guess plus five over the old guess over two that's the 2.25 i personally like to use fractions instead of decimals and I want you to also common denominators. I like this, it's called a rash, rational approximation. Nine over four is 2.25, which is uh, a pretty good approximation of the square root of five. If you on your calculator were to do 2.25, times 2.25, you get uh, 5.06, which is pretty close to five. Anyone suspect how I can calculate out what I'll call X2, my even better guess? So two is the first guess. For the first guess, I just picked the, 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 the biggest integer that's, that I know is two squares less than five, but three squares is greater than five. So X1 is this. Now I wanna calculate X2. Anyone have a suspicion of how I take my 2.25 or my 9 fourths answer and get an even better answer than that? That's right. Put the 9 fourths everywhere with these two words. So, so I'll first I'll write it as a formula. So it's the old guess plus five over the old guess over two, which in this case is nine over four plus five over nine over four over two. I'm gonna do this on a separate, on a new page. So X2 is nine over four plus five over nine over four over two. This is always a two. And this is just whatever it is I'm trying, like if I was trying to get the square root of seven, I'd have a seven up in this spot. 
But this two is always a two because it's taking the average sort of halfway between the old guess. And when you divide five by the old guess, and what's nice about this method is we don't even have to know if nine fourths is too big or too small. If nine fourths is too big, then five over nine fourths will be too small. And if nine fourths is too small, then five over nine fourths will be too big. So whether the nine fourths is a little bigger than the square root of five or a little smaller, it won't matter because the other one's gonna be the opposite and the average is gonna be even better. I'm gonna do this one. Here's what I, I think doing the arithmetic like this, uh, five over nine fourths is 20 over nine. I did that by doing five times four ninths. Then I get common denominator of 36. So I get 81 over 36 plus 80 over 36 over two. And the exact answer is 161 over 72. I, I personally like these. And on the, on the Delta math homework, you have to write the answers as fractions. 161 over 72 is 2.236 about. And if I square that on a calculator, 161 over 72 times 161 over 72, it's 5.00019. So it's, it's extremely close. Let me give you this whole thing as like a formula. A lot of people like to have just a nice formula. So I'll say, to find the square root of n, capital N, I'll call it, I'll say uh, x, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to call this the square root of m. So because I'm at, I have xn is x, I am allowed to go like this. The next guess is the old guess plus m over the old guess over 2. I like that. That's your formula. And as long as you have a starting guess, and your starting guess could actually be anything. It does not have to be the number that's like a little less than the square root, but I like us to use that. And for the Delta math, I want you to use that. So for square root of five, I would use two as X zero, but the truth is X zero can be anything. It just might take more steps to get an accurate answer. Do people have, um, yeah, I'll read that. It's a, it says x n plus one. That means like whatever the next guess is, the, the little subscript is what guess I'm on. This says x n, so it's like the guess I just did or the thing I just calculated and then plus m over x n. These two things are the same thing. And then over two. Now, if you have a TI calculator, which is a great calculator. Watch how nicely I can do this process on the TI calculator. So I put my initial guess to store X. And then I would go like this. Um, alpha Y equals, let's make a nice fraction. And I can say X plus five over x or whatever number I'm taking the square root of over two. And then here comes the sneaky thing, store that back into x. And another sneaky thing is say math one is fraction. Check this out, hit enter. <laughs> I guess that's not as, as uh, as good as I thought it was gonna be. I guess I have to take away that frack. Sorry about that, check it out. There's the 2.25. If I really wanna see what that was, I can turn it into a fraction, but look what happens. If I push enter again, it's gonna redo this calculation, but now X has been changed to 2.25. So there's the next answer. That's the one, that, and if I really want to see that as a fraction, I could say math enter enter now. And I could see the 161 over 72. 
Now if I push second enter, second enter, I can see better and better and better approximations. And eventually these, it becomes so precise that this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these 10 digits don't even change anymore because it's gotten that close. Okay, so for another example, let's look at the square root of two. I will come back to the iPad. So what's a good starting, whoops, not square root of x, but square root of two. What's a good starting guess? It could be anything, but I like, yes, I like to pick one for this because one squared is less than two, but two squared is bigger than two. Mm -hmm. So then we say x1 is x0, which came from here, plus two, which came from here, over x0, which also came from there, over two becomes 3 over 2, which is 1.5. Then we can say x2 is 3 over 2, which was this, plus 2, which was that, over 3 over 2 over 2. It becomes 3 over 2 plus 4 over 3 over 2. Common denominator of so something go wrong there. Let me think for a second. That looks okay. Common denominator of six, and I end up with uh, three times three is nine, two times four is eight, 17 over 12. Yeah, when the answers, as we say in math, converge. When they stop changing, it means that our answer is so close that when you take the, when you take, in the other case, five over it, that answer is almost the same answer. So when I average them together, they end up as almost as, as the same answer also. And I think on the homework, I have you calculate out the next, like the, these two things. Let me go back to the iPad for a second not the iPad, to the graphing calculator for a second. If I come over here and say one gets stored into X, and then I come back to that, to this calculation, but I change the five into a two. And now I get the three over two. Oh, that one made a fraction and did not make a decimal, but now it's making a fraction every time. No idea why for two it did that. For five, it was making decimals, but for two, it's making, let's see what happens next. 577 over 408. That's quite an excellent approximation. If you square that number, check this out. <clears throat> you get, that's really close to two. 577 over 408 is a famous approximation of the square root of two that comes up in a lot of cultures over the years. 17 over 12 is a pretty good approximation also. Okay, and that's the first thing I wanted to show you today. What we've done is we started by looking at this famous tablet, seeing that they had an approximation for square root of two and then I showed you an algorithm for calculating the square root of two. Oops, I'm not on the iPad anymore. I showed you an algorithm for uh, calculating the square root of two. The only thing unsatisfying about it is, I don't know how you can apply, I don't know how you could get this approximation for the square root of two. I mean, I guess it depends what, if you start with a different number, it will eventually get to a really close approximation, but you'll get different fractions along the way. And perhaps there's some starting point that wasn't one. I'm really not sure, but this is quite an amazing approximation, even though it's a little unsatisfying that that's, you would calculate that out 
using this algorithm, but this algorithm is often called the Babylonian algorithm. It's too bad it doesn't agree with the results from this tablet. On Delta Math tonight, you're gonna to do five questions like this where they, they give you a starting point and ask you to calculate out. And you leave the answers as improper fractions, not as decimals. So you'll want to, like for this one, you'd want to write three over two as one of your answers and 17 over 12 as the other. Anyway, it's real clever. This, this square root algorithm pops up in various branches of math, even in calculus in different ways. Okay, anyone have any questions about that before? That was the first 45 minutes. I have two things to do today. Babylonian square root algorithm. This is also called recursive algorithm. If anyone, uh, some people are teachers and you teach the algebra regions and you've seen like stuff like this, maybe they write a zero, you know, equals five and a n equals, you know, two times a n minus one plus one. And it generates like a, it's called recursive formula or a, a zero equals five, a two equals two times five plus one equals 11. A three is two times 11 plus one, 23 and so on. So that's what, that's what this basically is, is a recursive algorithm that uh, would it work with decimal. Well, if you started with 1.5 instead of one, you would actually, because what happens is that when you start with one, you get 1.5 as your second answer. So if you start with 1.5, it would work. So yes, you could start with 1.5 and you could actually start with the number 1,000 and it will, it will get there. It will take more steps to get close, but it will eventually get there. And it gets there pretty quickly. But yes, you can start with decimals. I personally like to start with an integer because the integer leads me to a nice fractional. I like these fractional approximations better than decimal approximations because the fractional decimal approximations might have like repeating decimals, but a fractional approximation with an integer in the numerator and denominator somehow like better than a decimal approximation, which is like rounded. Okay, any questions before I get to the next tablet? So we did 45 minutes on YBC 70, YBC 7289. And the rest of today is gonna to be on the most famous tablet of all, Plimpton 322. And this is like the famous picture of it. And based on this picture, it looks like it's really large. It looks like, you know, it looks like it's at least like two feet wide. It just looks like a large thing that they carried around like the Ten Commandments. But actually, Plimpton 322 is very small. And when I went to see it for the first time, or the only time, I was kind of shocked that it was only about two, two inches wide, which meant this writing on it was tiny. But I guess clay was a resource back then that was costly. So you wouldn't make a giant tablet to do what they speculate. This was like a homework assignment that a student did because it has mistakes in it. Uh, so, so there's like, they suspect that it's like a, a student who's practicing. Um, anyway, it was very small. Here is a sort of artist drawing of it. Still kind of hard to see what's going on. Actually for homework, remember the other day you had to do 10, uh, 10 numbers? Well, I took them from Plimpton 322. I actually copied it right out of there. Those were the 10 numbers that you converted from base 60 to, to base uh, to base 10 for homework two classes ago. Yeah, I need to post some homework answers. I'm sorry I haven't. Um, I have to collect the, the answers are in a bunch of different 
uh, I assembled them from different assignments. I'm going to try. Certainly, if you've got the delta math right, you know, you know that you're in good shape. But I, but I do want to post all the homework answers. I'm going away for the next week, and I'm going to have limited time, which I'm going to try to. I'm going to still attempt to do live classes. Um, so I may not get those homeworks up by this weekend. Incidentally, you could check these answers right now. These 10, two, four. Okay, those were the answers. Oh, it says due tomorrow. Uh, I, I, I want to make that due on, uh, I want to make that due on Monday. So I'm going to change that. It, uh, oh, it's due, it's due on Monday. That's the only assignment. Yes. Oh, it is due on Monday. Okay. So here are 10 of the numbers on Plimpton 322. And they're pretty mysterious. There's, notice how, if you look through, there, there's 15 rows on Plimpton 322. And the numbers in those two columns jump around a lot. There are small numbers like 119 and 169. Uh, the smallest two numbers on the whole thing are 45, 75. Then there's really large numbers like 12,709. And that's why Plimpton 322 is very mysterious because people wondered, you know, why do these numbers jump around as much as they do. Why are there large numbers, small numbers, large numbers, back to small numbers? Anyone have a suspicion about why the numbers jump around so much, at least in this translation? In this translation, the numbers seem to jump around. But why is this not the only possible translation of these numbers? They're just numbers. Anyone have a thought about that? I wanted to know the mystery of why the numbers jump around. Why are there small numbers and then big numbers and then small numbers? Like in this, in this, um, this column, the, the famous column, columns. Why are those numbers so like jumping around? Uh, well, yes, uh, they are math problems and a teacher is not necessarily going to make all the numbers go in order from, from big to small. That is actually a good uh, point. Yes, they, they added in some like missing columns in speculating. There's some Pythagorean theorem stuff going on. I will tell you the answer to that first mystery because each of these numbers this is speculated is actually has like a decimal point before it. So just like, it's just like, um, you know, point point four is not you know and then if I have if I have point three nine six five and then I have point four well if I remove the decimal point it looks like we have a really large number followed by a really small number but if I put a decimal point before both of them suddenly I realized they're both small numbers less than one. So we don't see where they're, they don't put a semicolon in Babylonian math, it's all implied. So the speculation is that these are actually not large numbers, but they're all numbers between zero and one. And in that way, they're not, uh, if you change them into, into those, you know, they would be about the same size. Okay, someone noticed that there was another column over here. Now that column is actually not part of the tablet. But the mystery of Plimpton 322 is that these numbers, 119 and 169, what all these pairs of numbers have in common, if I take 169 squared and subtract 119 squared, 
169 squared minus 119 squared, I get 14,400, which happens to be a perfect square. And we see another column, 4575. And I don't know where all my, I'm all over the place here. Just can't find my page, that's all right. Oh, he must be over here. That's all right. If I take 75 squared and I subtract 45 squared, I get 3,600, which is 60 squared. So someone said it has to do with Pythagorean theorem. Well, Pythagorean theorem is about triangles and right triangles and in a right triangle, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But, but forgetting about triangles for a second, sometimes when you add two perfect squares together, you get a perfect square. Usually not, sometimes you do. Anyone know what it's called when when you find integers that make this equation true, like we say three, four, and five, those three numbers are a Pythagorean triple. So Plimpton 322 suggests the first two numbers are always two numbers in a Pythagorean triple, and if we square the first number and subtract the square of the second and take the square root, we end up with a, um, an integer. So it suggests 15 different Pythagorean triples that they knew about. Uh, they subtract because they're saying C squared minus A squared equals B squared. So the first one is like the biggest, the, 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 the first number is the, um, is the bigger one. So it is subtract, but it suggests the Pythagorean triple. What are, besides three, four, five, you see three, four, five is Pythagorean triple. What's another Pythagorean triple that you know of? Okay, six, eight, 10 is also a Pythagorean triple. Because six squared plus eight squared is 100, which is 10 squared. But some people say, well, any multiple of three, right? That's true. If you take three, four, five and double it or triple it, you'll get Pythagorean triples. But in some ways, those all count in the same, like they're all in the three, four, five family. Is there a different family? Is there a, is there, does anyone know a Pythagorean triple that's not three, four, five multiplied by something? Anyone who taught algebra knows there's a little, there's, there's a few famous ones. Yes, the next famous one is five, 12, 13. By the way, the three, four, five, is known as a primitive, I don't even know if that's how you spell it, so I'm just gonna write it messy. Primitive Pythagorean triple and six, eight, 10 are like derived from it. And five, 12, 13 is another primitive one because there's no common factor of it. Yes, then I see 20, 21, 29, which is actually a um, lesser known Pythagorean triple, but it is one, seven, 24, 25. There's one more where the numbers are small. They're all less than 20. So three, if you're looking for all the Pythagorean triples where the numbers are less than 30, it's 345, 512, 13, 20, 21, 29, 7, 24, 25. And there's one more. Algebra teachers, you're pretty much limited to this set when you make up questions. You're limited to, um, oh, that's weird. My highlighter. Creative pen. I don't want a creative pen. 
I want a highlighter. There's only four that, yes, 8, 15, 17 is the other one. The four most popular Pythagorean triples are 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, 8, 15, 17, 7, 24, 25. This should be a popular Pythagorean triple. But most people don't know about that one. Even math teachers are sometimes surprised by that one. It's just right, because normally Pythagorean triple, the, 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 the two big numbers, the, the medium and the big number are really close to each other and the small numbers set apart. But in this one, the small and the medium are one apart from each other. Well, Plimpton 322 is a list of Pythagorean triples. And let me show you how they suggest they might have figured out how to create these Pythagorean triples. Remember in the warm up question, if you were, so some people came uh, a little bit late, um, but in the warm up question, which is over here, in the warm up question, we found that if you ever pick any x value greater than one, and do x plus one over x and divide by two and square it and subtract x minus one over x over two and square that, you always get the number one. So if that's true, we could say that x plus one over x over two squared is equal to one plus x minus one over x over two squared. But one itself is a perfect square. And this is gonna be our formula for generating Pythagorean tri triples. Watch how I do this. So if I, you can make x any number bigger than one. I like to pick an integer or an improper fraction. So let's say x equals two. I would have two plus one over two over two squared is equal to one squared plus two minus one over two over two squared. Well, two plus one over two is five over two divided by two is five over four squared equals one squared and two minus one half is three over two divided by two is three over four. Now that itself is not officially a Pythagorean triple because they're not integers. So what do you think you do to get the Pythagorean triple out of this? That's right. The numerators are the five and the three and the denominator, because if you took this entire thing and multiply, so, so the Pythagorean triple is five fourths, one, three fourths. But if I multiply everything by four, I get five, four, three. In other words, the, um, the two numerators and the denominator will end up becoming the Pythagorean triple. Now, you don't have to write all this stuff. We could summarize this as a formula. We can say that C is equal to X plus one over X over two. A is equal to X minus one over X over two. And then after you do those two things, after they're simplified, the two numerators and the denominator become the three answers. Let me put up a numerical example. Suppose I make X equal to five over two. So C is five over two plus one over X is one over five over two, which is the same thing as two over five. 
and a is five over two minus two over five over two. Now the nice thing about these two calculations is that they're the same, except one has a plus and one has a minus. So when you work out the common denominator, which is 10, you get 25 plus four. And for A, it's the same thing, but it's 25 minus four. But this becomes 29 over 20, and this becomes 21 over 20. And as you can see, 21, 29, 20 is a Pythagorean triple. Okay, let's have you practice one. And I'll put you into groups for it. Let's just, I could really pick any. I'm just going to say, let's, let's suppose that x equals 3 over 2. So I'll say do for x equals 3 over 2 and see what Pythagorean triple you end up with. We have 15 people. I'll, I'll throw you into uh, groups to work this one out, and then we'll go over why this mysterious algorithm works, and then we'll be done for today. Uh, let's see. I'll pause recording. Okay, everyone. I popped into each of the rooms, and it really makes me miss the uh, interaction uh, that students have when, like I've said, normally a good 40% of class time is working with your neighbors and being collaborative and people helping each other out. So you will, especially next week when I'm not promising that I can do live lessons, I hope you've made some connections and you could form a study group. Uh, you know, in a, regular, in a regular semester, you'd spend like five hours. You know, by the time you drive to City College and park and go to the two and a half hour class and drive home and do the homework, it would be like five hours. So you should, be budgeting, even though I know that, you know, if this is that we're here for an hour and a half today and the homework takes maybe, you know, an hour. Um, that's, a, that's a big time save. And of course, some of you have small children at home and things like that. You don't, you don't have five hours a day to spend on this. Nonetheless, uh, I hope that uh, some people are friends with each other already and maybe they can arrange to, to work together. Answer to this one was 5, 12, 13. Now you wonder, you know, why does this work? Well, the trick to seeing why this works is, you, remember we, we've seen that like a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. That's something that the Egyptian, that, that, that the Babylonians knew really well. This picture kind of demonstrates it pretty nicely. So if instead of a, I have x, and instead of b, I have one over x, I end up with x squared, but two a, b, I'll write two x, one over x, plus one over x squared. But look what happens, those x's cancel out. So x plus one over x is x squared plus two, literally the number two plus one over x squared. And similar, similarly, x minus one over x squared is x squared minus two plus one over x squared. Well, remember the other day I said that like a plus b squared minus a minus b squared is equal to four ab. A plus b squared has a two ab in the middle. A minus b has a minus two ab in the middle. Otherwise, they both have a squared and b squared. So 4ab is the difference. But for, for if a is 1 over x, if, if, if it's x, if I make this x and 1 over x, and this x and 1 over x, then the answer is going to be 4 times x times 1 over x, which is just 4. Always. And that's kind of why this works, because if I take this, I'll write it down. If I say x minus one, x plus one over x squared minus x minus one over x squared always equals four. If I divide everything by four, this becomes one, which is also one squared. 
and I'll throw this four inside the parentheses. And that's why this algorithm works. Everything the Babylonians do seems to be based on this identity. They didn't have this picture for it, but the idea that a plus b squared minus 4ab is equal to a minus b squared. It's how they did, it's why the multiplication algorithm, actually, is it why they multiplied? Yeah, it's why the multiplication algorithm worked. Remember the one where it was a plus b squared minus a minus b squared, and then you divide it by four? It's why the um, quadratic process from yesterday worked. It, it got us from x plus y over two to x minus y over two. And it's why this Pythagorean triple generating process works. So everything they do is based on this one mathematical insight. Well, the other delta math is doing questions where you generate a Pythagorean triple based on a given x value. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you today. So today's lesson was an hour and 15 minutes. We digested a lot. If it, if it were a, a class, this is the amount of stuff we would do because there'd be so much time to work together and more class discussion. I don't know next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm going to be out of town and I may not be able to get to the computer uh, at 2.30, so I can't promise. I do promise there'll be a video, if nothing else, and you'll have, hopefully this first week, you've made some connections. Uh, I'll leave the chat room open and if people wanna talk about how they might uh, communicate next week. The week after, I'll be back and I'm planning to do live lessons as often as I can, because I really think they help. But if nothing else, I really wanted to do the first week of live lessons to get people some confidence in the material, get to know each other. So I hope you like that. Let me, oh, did I, uh, I'll, I'm gonna stop the recording now.